for this presidential panel uh, that we put together uh, to discuss challenges in providing equitable surgical care in our diverse uh, healthcare systems. Um, I asked, uh, I talked to the senator after his, um, his address just now, and uh, what I'd like is for people to send in um, their impressions of that um, address, their thoughts. I want to feed it back to the senator. He'd like to hear what we thought of his address. And um, so if people want to send that uh, directly to me or Barb, um, and we can uh, collate that stuff, and I can, uh, want to talk to the senator again, I can let him know um, the impact. Um, I asked three past presidents to uh, give us an address, and essentially I, I want to give them each 15 to 20 minutes to talk about the um, challenges that are faced in providing equitable surgical care within the health system that they practice. And so uh, Janice is obviously in the Canadian health system and Miguel is in the Mexican health system. And I asked Peter Angelos to talk about the U.S. health system. Now I think many of you know that Peter uh, was not able to make it due to some family concerns. And so he has um, graciously given us his slides and Megan Applewhite uh, his protege and junior partner at the University of Chicago will be uh, giving his address as well. So I have a few words just to open the session. Um, I think you all know that we had three themes uh, for this session and I hope we were able to weave together those themes of leadership, health equity, and uh, Pan American partnership um, to uh, really drive home the importance of those things and how they overlap and interact in our society. Today's is going to be, this is kind of the bookend as I referred to it when I opened the, the meeting that we would talk about health equity on each side of it. And so why should we be focusing on that as a society? And it's a larger picture obviously. When there's health equity, everybody has a fair and just opportunity to attain their, their full health potential regardless of their socially determined circumstances. And that requires addressing SDOH and identifying and addressing root causes of health inequalities, or inequities, actually. So progress towards these things has been going on, but of course something terrible happened in 2020 and there was this pandemic. And that disrupted all of that. And it put a huge strain on health systems around the world. It also highlighted and exacerbated health inequalities in especially vulnerable populations specifically those that are in rural communities or in minority communities. They had reduced access, there was vaccine hesitancy, targeted misinformation, and overall mistrust in the healthcare system. And so there are three strategies that are generally employed when we're trying to promote change, and uh, they're downstream, midstream, and upstream strategies. And I'll take just a minute to highlight some of those things that are out there. Downstream strategies are interventions that involve individual level approaches for treatment or prevention of disease. It's kind of like what we do every day in our clinic. But here are some examples of things that are done that are considered downstream strategies that impact various health inequity and social inequity issues around the country. I think you're all familiar with this stuff and you've all maybe participated in one of the more. I told you my mother was a teen pregnancy class teacher in my community. Midstream strategies are approaches that usually are taken on by organizations, um, like maybe your employer uh, offering employee benefits, like gym memberships, wellness funds. We know that uh, smoking is banned essentially all uh, work sites around the country nowadays, paid time off for children and uh, for childcare raising, maternity, paternity leave, workplace health and safety. At some institutions, they tie vaccination status to incentive comp and other things to try to just, it's a strategy to try to improve the health of their workforce. Upstream strategies, however, are the hardest things, but also have the potential to create the most change. And this is usually like policy changes that affect a large population. And it can be done by governments through things like regulation, access, or economic incentives. What can we do that's upstream in our organization? It's probably mostly access. Access to expertise, access to education, uh, that type of access. 
And you can see that we've put in um, a number, I've put in a number of examples here of upstream types of strategies that are out there that um, are policy based that also, if you think about it, make it, have made huge differences on health outcomes in the country. So the, the challenge is to think about upstream strategies, mid and upstream strategies that this organization could potentially um, come up with. And I want to share with you this quote from Desmond Tutu uh, where he points out that there comes a time where we need to stop pulling people out of the river and instead we need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in to characterize the importance of that strategy. So I'll just gonna, I'm just kicking off this to, to kind of get you guys thinking about what the AAS can do to drive towards health equity, including a building local capacity to meet local needs. You saw a number of excellent presentations yesterday where we have the whole map out there and you can see these huge deserts where we don't have anybody. We can increase diversity in our research and our clinical trials. Ask yourself, where are we conducting research and upon whom? I had an amazing conversation um, with uh, Tom Conley the other day about uh, his heritage is Cherokee and he has connections within um, Native American communities that we don't even touch. We don't know anything about their healthcare needs from an endocrine surgery standpoint especially. Um, also, how are we taking account SDOH when we do our research projects, when we have our uh, research committee meet and look at all those applications? How do we take all those impact things into, into account? How often are we allowing patients themselves to help define our research priorities? When I was the chair of the Education Research Committee, we didn't do that at all. Now we're doing that. We can do that more probably. And also, how many partnerships have we developed with organizations, communities, governments, businesses, et cetera, to amplify or leverage our influence. When I thought about the themes for my presence, presidency year, I, I thought also about advocacy and how I might be able to, to weave that in, but I'm gonna leave that to the next president or the president after that. But these are, I think, essential partnerships that we have to have to amplify the message and get uh, people what they need. So I'm going to end with that as a, uh, for the opening uh, part of this, and I, I hope the slides are in the right order. We'll have the, the first, uh, if you just want to bring up the next slide, I can, I'm not sure what order we did it. <laughs> it's probably uh, Janice is my guess. I can't see what's on the, on the thing. If you want to bring up the slides for Janice. Let's, uh, let's welcome Janice Pasika to the podium. Sorry, it's just not showing yet on the thing. So I'm still like uh, dumbfounded by it. So when the, when the slides come up on the monitor, they're just probably loading. There we go. Then you just advance with the green. Thank you for that lesson on how to use the slides. Thank you very much, uh, Cord, and, and thank you for um, inviting me to this panel and to the audience for, uh, for staying. It's true, uh, that's a hard act to follow, so we are going to uh, shift gears. Court asked me to talk about the Canadian healthcare system, uh, probably because many don't know exactly how different our system is to the United States. And it really, I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to actually spend some time reading about the Canadian Health Act. In our country, we do a truth and reconciliation, so in the spirit of truth and reconciliation, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that I have the privilege of working, but more importantly, exploring the traditional territories of the traditional, of the people of Treaty 7 in Southern Alberta. And it's the exploring part that I get to do on a not a weekly basis out in the mountains that keeps me healthy, keeps me sane, keeps me fit, and allows me to take care of my patients. I have no disclosures, but for those of you in the audience that don't know you, uh, don't know me, I am a proud Canadian, um, and I just thought I should tell you that. Um, but I am not an expert in healthcare policies, and everything I say today will be opinions of my own. Now, the Canadian health system uh, started before I was born. I want to make sure that's out on the record. Um, <laughs> In 1957, there was something called the Hospital Insurance Diagnostic Service Act. And then, 
And then it went to the people and uh, a lot of negotiations and a lot of uh, political will to come up uh, on the, uh, from one of our premiers, Tommy Douglas, and in 1966, the uh, Medical Care Act, which was legislation to provide provincial funding from our federal government to each of the provinces for hospital and physician services. And it, this is just a, an excerpt from uh, all of the deliberations, but the Canadian people determined that they should band together to pay medical bills and hospital bills when they were well and income, income earning. Health services were no longer to be bought off the shelf and paid for at the checkout stand, nor was their price to be bargained at the time they were sought. We, uh, they were a fundamental need, such as education, and Canadians would meet collectively and pay through this through our taxes. So our tax system pays into the federal government, and we have transfer payments to our provinces. This was then revised by what is now called the Canadian Health Act in 1984, and Medicare, as it's called, is a fundamental part of Canada's national identity and represents Canadians' ongoing commitment to the values of equity, fairness, and solidarity. Continued access to quality health care without financial or other barriers will be critical to maintaining and improving the health and well-being of all Canadians. So does it work? Well, this is uh, from, uh, from 2019. This is the age-adjusted life expectancy uh, when you reach the age of 60. And the average for developed, uh, economically developed countries is 80.4 uh, years. Canada is similar at 81.7. And that pales in comparison to this country, the United States, at 77 and 75 for Mexico. So the Canadian Health Act uh, is a, uh, essentially, it uh, is made up of five criteria, and recently they've added two conditions. And the two conditions are no extra billing or user charges um, to the patients uh, for anything that's an insured service. And if you meet these five criteria and these two conditions, you're guaranteed the transfer of payments. So what are these? Well, the first is it has to be publicly administered. That means every one of our hospitals is a not-for-profit hospital. Comprehensiveness. All medically, and the word necessary is an important one, services by hospitals and physicians, dentists if they work out of a hospital, but all hospital charges and all physicians will be paid under this insurance policy. Universality to us means that it is for all residents, uh, Canadian and landed immigrants. Portability, there's reciprocal agreements between each of the province for three months. So therefore, if I move to Ontario, I have three months with my Alberta health insurance while I go through the paperwork and get Ontario health insurance. And then accessibility, reasonable access based on need, not on the ability to pay. We have a couple of direct things that do not come out of our provincial and territorial health insurance, and these are um, for our First Nation people living on reserve, the Inuit, serving members of the armed forces, the RCMP, our inmates, and some groups of, ref of refugees. So all physicians and all hospitals, the service is funded, quote, by a single payer. But it's not one Canadian payer. It's actually 13 provincial and territorial um, health care insurance plans. So each province can figure out how, what they deem as necessary and what they deem as the payment. There's a lot of variability in what are necessary services. In Ontario, they do provide um, uh, coverage for um, dental care and eye care. Alberta does not, uh, ambulance, ho um, um, home care, the provinces negotiate it themselves. Payment is also then negotiated at a provincial level. So what I earn to do a total thyroidectomy is very def different than what Jesse Pesternak would get in Ontario for his total uh, parathyroidectomy. And access to certain um, treatments and modalities also provincially um, negotiated. So gallium-68 dotatate was only available in a couple of provinces up until recently. 
A lot of people compare it to the National Health Services in Britain where the doctor is an employee of the government because we are paid through a government insurance plan, but I, they're different. They're at a sessional fee, so they come in, they put their hours in, they get paid that sessional fee. In Canada, practically most of us are fee for service. That means I only get paid when I operate on a patient, then I submit the bill and I get paid that from my health care, um, uh, from the uh, Alberta government. So in Alberta, there's over 10,000 physicians and over 80% of us are all fee for service. There's only a very small portion that actually get a salary and a salary that was usually provided at the university. And this is just to show you how diverse it is with each province. If you look at Alberta, 80% of us are pure fee for service with very few um, having salary or what we call alternative payments versus other provinces uh, like Nova Scotia and a means of trying to retain uh, more physicians in their province, they are paying them a salary on top for all of the other work that they do in education and research. Just a couple of myth busters about the Canadian healthcare system. It is not free. The average cost per patient in 2022 was uh, over $8,000 a year. And this just shows you a graph as going over time that in 2022, $331 billion was paid for health care um, in, in Canada. And that makes up uh, just over 12% of our gross domestic product. How do we compare to other countries? The graph on the uh, left, we are second to United States in uh, percentage of our gross domestic product. And how much do we pay per uh, uh, patient per year, we are fourth among uh, developing countries, um, uh, economically um, diverse countries. Mythbuster number two, it's a comprehensive coverage. No, as I told you, each province uh, negotiates their own way of how they're going to pay for the citizens of their province or territory. And up to 60% of Canadians actually do have supplement private coverage. Uh, if you're in Ontario, there's an income-based uh, tax that is added on, so the high-income earners are charged a separate tax, and that allows them to have uh, a universal or a near-universal coverage of their um, drugs with only a minimal deductible. In uh, Quebec, um, it was tested in uh, the recent COVID, um, crisis. Um, they then came out as the hospitals were struggling. How are we going to um, uh, keep uh, our citizens healthy? So there was the debate about vaccinations or no vaccinations. So the premier came out and said there will be a small fee for if you have to access the hospital and you're non-vaccinated. And that lasted four days before the political fallout made him withdraw that. And those of us that were uh, really keen thought that that was, a, that was a positive step. But again, all of these decisions are politically driven. We do have private facilities. We do have private clinics that provide surgical services that can provide an MRI or a CT, but they're provincially approved and they actually come in under the act. So again, it's not for profits uh, situation. As a patient, I just walk in there and my healthcare insurance covers me for having the surgical service or the uh, CT as long as it's approved by the province. This guy, uh, Dr. Uh, Day, he's been fighting this uh, legislation um, and trying to get uh, for-profit private clinics where those that want to pay and skip the queues because we have long waits. Um, and just uh, recently, last, day, uh, last month, uh, the Supreme Court refused to hear this argument, so it's sort of dead in the water right now of having any for-profit uh, facilities. The last myth buster is that um, we are a two-tiered system. We're not a two-tiered system that those that can pay and those that can't pay, but it's a matter of those that live in urban versus rural areas because access is the main problem with our system. It, to access a specialist, you must have a referral from a, uh, a GP. 
Six million Canadians are without a family practitioner, and that is going to be even more of a problem as we see the number of residencies um, that are filled in the match for family practitioners is decreasing. And this past year, they just announced that there were 100 unmatched family physician uh, spots, uh, residency spots across the country. This is pre-COVID data for a non-urgent wait time to see a specialist across our country is four months, 21 weeks. In Ontario, it's 16 weeks, but in New Brunswick, it's 10 months. And the disparity of access is directly proportional to the distance from an urban centre. Canada is not proud to have the longest surgical wait times among uh, the economically rich countries. So COVID hit, and it really then brought out the stresses of our healthcare system. This graph here along the bottom, you can see the various waves of the, um, of the uh, pandemic. And this is the change in surgical volumes um, compared to 2019. And so when it first hit, we went down to 75% reduction in what surgery was doing, because we shut down. But every wave that we went through hospitals completely shut down in some form. And so you can see we still haven't gotten back up to 2019 standards. And this is going to be a huge problem for us. 6% fewer cancer cases were diagnosed in 2020. People weren't going out, they weren't accessing, they couldn't access their screening and the diagnostic tools. And I found this piece of data really telling. Canada has 15 CT scanners for per million people, compared to 42 per million in, in US. And look at Australia, 70 CT scanners per million of Australians. So we have another access problem. And that means the number of cancer cases that were diagnosed and are being treated is, going, is, is, is still way below 2019 levels. And you can see on this graph that lung cancer is still behind. Therefore, as we've now come out of the pandemic in many ways, these people are now going to start to be diagnosed and we're going to expect an incredible increase in the number of cancers and 60% of all cancers require surgery. So endocrine surgery was hit really hard. Uh, one reason that the endocrinopathies of benign tumors, FEOs, Cushing's, Cons, hyperparathyroidism, these were benign tumors, we were denied access every single wave. Thyroid cancer being clinically indolent was way down on the list uh, even when we started ramping up and we could do cancers. I can tell you we sat waiting while our hepatobiliary surgeons, breast surgeons were able to access. Only 80% of the postponed surgeries have been completed in our province, and a lot of that has been because they then came up with chartered surgical facilities, provincially funded, here's a hospital, you can now do surgeries, the patients then just see it as extra hospital rooms in the city, but priority was given to those that they're monitoring, the index cases, joint replacement, cataracts, and breast cancer. So you can see endocrine wasn't on that. To sort of summarize, what's the upside of the Canadian Health Act? Well, all emergencies and life-threatening services do get treated. You just come into the hospital. It provides the necessary uh, care, but you have to queue up. It is one payer, so I don't have to negotiate with insurance companies. I just submit the bill to my provincial government. And it has never been involved in decisions of employment, concerns over losing one's health care coverage. The downside is the access, the wait times, underserviced areas are going to be hit the hardest. And we really have 13 different health insurance uh, policies across Canada. And like all things, poli politicians tend to be reactive as opposed to proactive. What do I see as the challenges for endocrine surgery? Well, unfortunately, endocrine surgery is now a second priority in the General Surgery Royal College training program. Not all 17 medical schools across our country have a fellowship trained endocrine surgeon on faculty. I think there's still a real disconnect between the detrimental health effects of endocrinopathies versus the word cancer. 
and of course we continue to have limited resources and the fee-for-service model is just not sustainable for education, research and advancement. How can the AES help? Continue to train for, uh, Canadians that, but send them back to Canada. Stop keeping them so that we can continue to grow. <laughs> I think we need to advocate for the advantages of having a surgical endocrinologist on a faculty because we add value. And we need to lobby for and scientifically demonstrate the surgical benefits of correcting an endocrinopathy and the importance. And with that, I will thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pasika. That was really fantastic. I think the next person I want to call up is uh, Megan Applewhite, if you could uh, pull up her slides. And um, uh, she's going to talk to us about uh, uh, ethical issues for uh, delivery of care in the U.S. I'm just waiting for your slides. I saw my slides. And I think uh, hopefully we'll have time at the end for a couple quick questions. We'll do questions at the very end. All right, take it away. Hi. Um, I'm, uh, in fact, not a past president. I'm so sorry. I'm also not Peter Angelos, but um, um, I really hope to do his slides justice here. So I'm, I'm Megan Applewhite. I am um, an associate professor of surgery at Albany Medical College, and I'm the director of the Bioethics Institute there as well. Um, and uh, Peter is doing fine. Uh, a few have asked me to make sure he's okay. He's okay. His family's all right. Uh, he just um, had to miss the meeting. Um, so we're going to talk uh, here about the ethical challenges of providing equitable endocrine surgical care. Um, I think, you know, the goal of this talk is really to frame the need for health equity um, in terms of a, an ethical problem. And I think that looking at it from that perspective can give us a lot of advantages in how we approach these problems, which we've outlined, um, but now we need to figure out how to, how to go about fixing them. So in terms of disclosures, uh, Peter has no disclosures. Um, I will disclose that I am a senior ethics consultant to the Department of Defense Medical Ethics Center, um, but none of what I will say today does reflect the views of the US government. We do have a couple of disclaimers, however. Um, so much of what I'll present here is opinions. Um, the evidence that we'll bring up is evidence that has been brought up in the last few days and, and in the last couple of years as people have been demonstrating more and more with excellent studies. Um, how disparities in care are real. And we're likely to raise more questions than have answers, but I guess the goal of all of this is really to just start a discussion about how on the individual, small group and large group level, we can start to think about um, uh, making access and outcomes equivalent between our patient groups. So as a general outline, uh, first we'll talk about the scope of clinical medical ethics. So we'll start about, you know, how we start to think about medical ethics in the very traditional form, and then we'll sort of advance on to how we really should be thinking about medical ethics, and how about how this, um, this framework of medical ethics as a, a big societal impact uh, is one that'll help guide our ability to give equitable care to our patients. Um, and that it is uh, going to outline the importance of mitigating disparities in this framework. Talk about what the AAES can do, about what endocrine surgery fellowships can do, uh, and then what individual surgeons can do. You know, I think um, I am guilty of, of hearing about um, advocacy and sort of thinking, oh my goodness, does this mean I have to go and stand on the steps of the Capitol? And do I have to write letters to my legislators? And do I have to um, you know, get petitions signed? And it seems really overwhelming. But really truthfully, if I think that if we, we frame this problem in terms of an ethical problem, we encounter patients every day, right? And on an individual level, if in fact we can, we can change things in what we do every day, we can have a big influence as just one person um, and just as one section and just as one society. So where should we focus our attention? Our scope defines what we see as our ethical responsibilities. And so if we view our scope of practice as us and our patients, our ethical responsibility is to our patients. But as we shift our point of view, our ethical responsibilities similarly shift and broaden. So if, as we think about our individual relationships, we think about who else comes into play with those relationships, families, other practitioners, our health systems, the world around us, we then recognize that it's not just the dyad of the physician and the patient, but it's the community. 
And so it really does then shift from the bedside of the patient to the bedside of the community of what our scope really is. So here we see the traditional view of clinical ethics. You see um, the doctor and the patient. They're largely isolated from the outside world, and it's really focused on their relationship. Again, this dyad of the physician being the caretaker and the patient um, uh, trusting this physician to do what is in their best interest. This is very, very much a traditional view. But when you think of it, there's a lot more that goes into the care of a patient. And so when you put the patient and the doctor within the family context, I really wish we had Dr. Heller here from the Met because he would do this painting much more justice than I can. But you can really see that the spotlight is still on the doctor and on the patient, who in this case is a child, right? And if you can see in the background, I'm not sure how well it projects, you can see the parents. The father is sort of in the darkness there and comforting the mother who's crying because they have an ill child. It is in fact impossible to disconnect the care of this patient from the rest of the family. And we see it all the time, right? So we take care of patients and we don't, God willing, everybody's hospitals have sort of progressed from not letting visitors come in on new visits, right? Because that was really tough um, for the patients, I think, and for us. But now, you know, you go into the, the office and, and, and they bring somebody with them. They have a friend, they have a relative, they have a neighbor, but they have someone who cares for them. So it really is, it is really expanding a wider view beyond, beyond the dyad of the, the physician and the patient alone to include parents and children, siblings and spouses. So you're seeing um, the, the traditional view of clinical ethics sort of stepping back a little bit. And it again widens because healthcare involves so many other caregivers, right? And in the AAES, we know this well. We are not just surgeons. We are APPs. We are scientists. We are people who have dedicated our careers to the surgical endocrinopathies of patients, but we can't do it by ourselves. So we rely on our nurses and our nurse practitioners, on physician's assistants, therapists, social workers, technicians, and MAs. And so you can sort of see where we're going with this, that you know, initially what you could perceive as our ethical responsibility being to our patient, it's really impossible to ignore this in the greater context of taking care of patients. And you zoom out even farther, and in fact, healthcare occurs within a health system, in a society. Our clinical interactions cannot be isolated from the broader system in which they occur. And to be honest, we probably never saw this so clearly outlined until the pandemic. Um, care that we were used to take, care that we were used to be able to take care of our patients and give them whatever they wanted whenever they needed it. Sure, you can go on dialysis, like, yeah, you can have this ECMO machine. Yeah, you can have a ventilator, you know, you're borderline, but you know, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, we didn't have that luxury, right? We had restricted resources and the care of our patients had to sort of shift from being the, the patient physician dyad into the greater public good. We were forced to make decisions about rationing of resources um, and, it, and it was a shift. So we cannot assume a narrow view of clinical ethics anymore. It ignores the broad appreciation of public health and about how it impacts individual patients. So in fact, this is the ethical imperative to improve equity. In clinical ethics, we often focus on principles of beneficence doing good and non-maleficence avoiding harm to our patients, directly to our patients, Sally. John, who's ever sitting in front of you. You want to do the best for them, explain the risks, benefits, and alternatives to surgery, and that's our job. That is our ethical responsibility. But as we've sort of just seen, you can't isolate it to just that relationship, because that's not reality. That might be the clinic visit, but that's not real life. Beneficence and non-maleficence also apply within a broader societal perspective. We have a responsibility to reduce disparities in access. We have a responsibility to mitigate disparities in outcomes. I would argue that the single greatest ethical challenge facing medical care in the US today is how to reduce disparities in access and outcomes that our patients face. And of course, this is not a new idea. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1966 said, of all of the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhumane. And there are a lot of forms of inequality. 
And this continues to be one of the most shocking and inhumane. This was documented in the health disparities section yesterday. And, and throughout the presentations of this whole conference, which were wonderful, <laughs> I think we have now defined where the problems are, and I'm sure we'll discover many more. Um, but our challenge now is to figure out where to go and how to fix it, how to address it individually and as a group. So what can the AAES do? Uh, Dr. Sturgeon had a slide that was, it's gonna kick the butt of the slide, but you know, with many more detailed initiatives, and I'm sure Dr. Solorzano has, has many plans in store as well. Um, but I guess, you know, we, we, can, we can improve educational offerings, right? And we can make our, um, we can make our educational offerings maybe available to more people who can't necessarily make the meeting. Maybe there are two of them and they both need to be in the hospital to be on call, right? Maybe they have, um, maybe they're the only surgeon in their building. Uh, maybe they can't afford to come to the meeting or they're not supported to come to the meeting. Um, we can create educational programs that are affordable and readily accessible to surgeons who do low volume endocrine surgery, which as we saw yesterday and in multiple papers before, they do a majority of the endocrine cases, so it would be um, in the best interest of the patients. And if, in fact, we are wanting to give our patients access to excellence, we need to provide that. And finally, we could provide more resources to patients to help empower them to seek out optimal care. What can endocrine surgery fellowships do? And here you'll see a picture of um, Peter Angelos with Dr. Norm Thompson when Peter was a fellow. And he pointed out to me that um, he did own loops, but he was you know, 32 years old and, and felt like because Dr. Thompson didn't wear loops that he didn't really have a good excuse to, um, to put them on. So um, what can we do in endocrine uh, surgery fellowships? So we can train fellows to provide optimal care in multiple settings. I think that our natural inclination is to train academic surgeons. We wanna make people in our own likeness. I mean, I think that's true. We wanna raise our children the way we were raised, right? We wanna raise our residents and our fellows, you know, in, in the way that we see um, them being the most successful. But I guess then I challenge, what is the definition of success? And if in fact we have these giant endocrine surgery deserts across the United States, maybe we have to rethink what a successful fellow is and how we're looking at the applications. And maybe we should be interviewing those people that have one or two publications, but have a good background in community service versus 20 to 30 first author publications, you know, just to think about potentially spreading out the wealth of where we can send those people and where interests may lie best to serve our patients who right now are underserved in those areas. Um, Yes, and here basically that there's a tremendous unmet need. And, and we did talk about that yesterday and that was the, the abstract or the, the uh, presentation winner and very, very well earned. Um, we could also utilize virtual meetings to welcome community participation in our tumor board conferences and other educational activities. And this doesn't necessarily have to just be true of programs that have endocrine surgery fellowships. Any sort of formal end endocrine training can, can allow, can outsource, right? So if we have community endocrine surgeons or if we have endocrine surgeons sort of in the periphery that aren't necessarily affiliated with our hospitals that are low volume, we can invite them in. Um, and there may be HIPAA issues and there are gonna be other roadblocks and it seems like a bigger sort of um, lift than maybe it is, but I think those things are worth addressing if in fact we wish to provide excellent care to more patients. What can individual surgeons do? Well, we can provide the best quality care to as many patients as possible. We can seek to encourage collaboration with low volume surgeons because we know particularly in the United States and probably across the Americas, the majority of the endocrine cases are done by low volume surgeons. What we also know is that patients aren't really willing to travel too far for their care, nor should we expect them to. Who's gonna watch their kids? Who's gonna drive them home and back? Can they take a couple of days off of work instead of one day off of work? <laughs> Bringing excellence to the patients. Maybe helping to train the surgeons who are lower volume. Maybe supporting them throughout their decision making for operating can be better for these patients. And this can really work on the individual level. You can establish trust with, with other surgeons in the area and you can really build relationships that the, then can grow and flourish. We can maintain our knowledge by keeping up with the literature and adopting improvements in care to benefit our patients. 
and we can be vigilant in addressing the needs of the most vulnerable of our patients. One other thing that I would add to this is that we can talk very explicitly with our trainees about what disparities in care we know exist. Disparities in outcomes, disparities in access, because we've defined them. Yesterday, defined them. People continue to write about them, and they're real. So I think the onus is on us to understand those data and to talk explicitly with our trainees about how they can incorporate that into taking care of patients. Knowing it is one thing, but taking action to work against it is the next step, and I think that's where we need to go. So in conclusion, we know that disparities in access and outcomes occur. We must move beyond documenting those, uh, those disparities and seek to make positive change. The AAES should seek to improve equitable endocrine surgical care, and steps in that way have been taken significantly recently, and we should recognize that. Surgical residency programs and fellowships should actively seek to train surgeons who will succeed in a variety of settings. And introspection is needed to assess what each of us can do in our own setting, including creating relationships with low-volume surgeons and speaking in explicit and very frank ways with our trainees about how we need to improve care for our most vulnerable patients. Thank you so much. Very, very nice. That was a great talk, Megan. Thank you so much. Uh, I know uh, we all uh, hope Peter's family is doing better. Um, the final uh, uh, leader of this organization <laughs> to come and talk to us about health equity across the Americas is my good friend Miguel Herrera. Welcome him to the podium. And let's have uh, Miguel's slides brought up, please. Thank you very much. So according uh, to the interests of Dr. Sturgeon and the rest of the leadership of the AAES on leadership, health equity, and Pan-American outreach, I was invited uh, to be part of this presidential session along with Dr. Angelos, now Dr. Applewhite, Dr. Pasica. But he gave me specific instructions. He said, <laughs> prepare a talk short, on bold, on providing endocrine surgery care and the health system in your home country. Highlight challenges and wins. Hi highlight gaps and barriers to health equity, and most importantly, the obligations as a professional society to bridge those gaps and seek solutions to problems that are within our sphere of influence. Before focusing on endocrine surgery, I would like to give you a brief description of the health system and economy in Mexico so you can have a better picture of the environment where we work. In 1983, the Mexican Constitution, in its article number four, declared the right of free medical care to all Mexican citizens without social security. The Mexican health system has some notable strengths, such as universal health coverage through numerous public insurance programs. It has also a strong primary health care system, which provides basic medical services and preventive care to patients. Additionally, Mexico has made progress in reducing mortality rates with improved access to health care services and a focus on public health education. And finally, Mexico has a range of specialized healthcare services available that go from high-tech hospital care to alternative and holistic medicine. Healthcare is provided by several institutions. The IMSS, or the Mexican Social Security Institute, takes care of the workforce of private institutions. Both workers and employers contribute for the health services. They include medical consultations, hospitalizations, pharmaceutical services, as well as other social security benefits, such as retirement and disability pensions, unemployment insurance, and housing assistance. 
The ISSSTE provides similar services to the IMSS, but it is only available for those who work for the government or have retired from a government job. It receives solely government funding. The Army and the Navy, as well as the oil industry, have their own health services and hospitals. And the health secretary provides health services to the uncovered population. The IMSS is the largest public insurance program, covering close to 50% of, of the Mexican population and about three quarters of the workforce. Unfortunately, there are several weaknesses in the health system in Mexico. One of the main issues is a lack of funding, which leads to insufficient resources and facilities in hospitals and clinics. This results in long waiting times and suboptimal quality care for patients. There are disparities in healthcare access and quality between rural and urban areas, as well as between different socioeconomic groups. There is a shortage in health professionals, and the healthcare workforce also faces challenges, such as low pay, overcrowding, and lack of resources. Finally, a set of complex regulatory measures exacerbate many of these problems. As we can see here, compared to other countries, the national head expenditure as percentage of the gross domestic product is quite low. And between 2010 and 2019, the expenditure financed by the government decreased by 0.2% with the consequent slightly increase in the out-of-pocket expenditure. The number of hospital beds and CT scanners per million population is quite low. As an example of the regional disparities in Mexico, only 82% of the entire population has available and rapid access, defined as less than two hours, to essential surgical care, such as emergency laparotomies, cesarean deliveries, and the management of open fractures. And this 82% may be even lower if we consider that the estimation was based on Google Maps assuming that patients would go by car. As you all know, we endocrine surgeons aim to practice in centers of excellence in the hopes of providing high quality patient care while also promoting clinical research and training. This ideal environment hangs on several essential components. A multidisciplinary team that includes endocrinologists, radiologists, pathologists, anesthesiologists, in addition to endocrine surgeons, accreditation and certification by national and international organizations, ensuring that the program meets the highest standard of care, well-established clinical pathways and guidelines for the screening, diagnosis, and treatment of the endocrine disorders, as well as postoperative care and follow-up quality improvement initiatives to ensure that the program is meeting or exceeding its goals, prioritizing pricing patient care or patient-centered care, and education and training as well as full commitment to the advancement of the field through research and innovation. Since our country is in the phase of development, our limited health system resources require well-thought distribution. And unfortunately, the development of high quality and or high volume endocrine surgical centers is not one of the country's short-term priorities. To complicate matters further, there is only one academic program for endocrine surgery training. Most endocrine surgical diseases are treated by general surgeons or in the best case scenario, surgical oncologists. Many patients in Mexico are not aware of the symptoms and risk associated with endocrine disorders, delaying timely diagnosis and treatment. These barriers can only be overcome by establishing a strict collaboration between healthcare professionals, government branches, and patient advocacy organizations. 
In terms of funding, it is imperative to support the development and implementation of new programs. The government should increase its investment in healthcare by providing the necessary resources, facilities, and equipment to establish endocrine surgery centers across the country. Incorporating obesity as an endocrine surgical related disease could be a, a strategy to influence the government and healthcare system to increase the funding, since it is a major Mexican healthcare problem. Funding may also be obtained through private donations and partnerships with healthcare organizations and academic institutions. Regional disparities in healthcare access and outcomes could be addressed by supporting and collaborating with physicians in underserved and remote areas, providing incentives to healthcare professionals willing to work in those places, establishing telemedicine programs and mobile surgical units designed to provide specialized care, standardizing care across the country by developing and implementing national guidelines and protocols to ensure that patients receive the same level of high quality care regardless their location. Healthcare professional shortages can be addressed by providing specialized endocrine surgery training to general surgeons and nursing personnel, enabling them to solve most endocrine surgical diseases. Doing this, only patients requiring secondary or tertiary care management would warrant referral. Increasing patient awareness of endocrine disorders and the availability of specialized care may only be may only succeed through public education campaigns by providing access to patient education resources, by working with patient advocacy organizations capable to increase awareness of the consequences of mismanaged endocrine diseases. Also, a well-known and efficacy proven strategy is to involve community leaders to help deliver and monitor patient-directed programs and policies. Finally, Streamlining healthcare regulations could potentially provide clear and transparent funding opportunities, while also decreasing administrative burdens currently dependent on healthcare professionals. Finally, how could professional societies contribute to the development of endocrine surgery in Mexico? They can collaborate with Mexican healthcare professionals by sharing their best practices. They can also offer training and support to promote research and education in the field. They can also provide technical support and expertise in terms of the creation and maintenance of endocrine surgery centers by sharing of protocols and guidelines for patient care and the training of healthcare professionals. Research and education can be further promoted by supporting and collaborating in research initiatives. They can also advocate for funding and policy support from international organizations. Some organizations have started this type of programs, such as the Interest Program Initiative of the IAES. I bring warm greetings from our country to all of you and would like to thank Dr. Sturgeon and his group for the interest and for the opportunity of participating in this important initiative. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank our, our three panelists for uh, a really exceptional um, capstone to this uh, meeting. Uh, as I told you all before, I, I had uh, a vision of three themes, and they've really woven them together in this final session. And um, I know that we're running uh, about 15 minutes behind, and so I'll, I'll uh, make sure we're going to move right into the next session. But I just wanted to make a couple comments. I think that um, these are excellent ideas, and uh, we've already started uh, along this road. The organization is continuously evolving, but, but at the same time staying true to, to our mission statement. 
and the upcoming uh, retreat that we'll do in Nashville this year, we'll be thinking hard about these things and how we can push forward uh, in a meaningful way. But it is really encouraging to me because I've heard that so many of you have already reached out to our um, the leaders within our uh, committees and task force to volunteer your help. And uh, that tells me what I need to know about how uh, this message has reached you and how it's also meaningful to you as it is to me. But anyway, I'm going to conclude this presidential panel. I thank you all for amazing contributions that you've given and continue to give to the society. Thank you. Thank you.